Okay, so the next photographer that we will actually talk about is a photographer that went by the name of Man Ray. And he actually went beyond the camera itself to achieve more inventive effects. So he actually kind of created this technique that he called rayographs. And he made these by placing objects on light sensitive paper and then taking them outside and exposing them to sunlight. So they're not really fo photographs and there's really no camera or lens involved. It's just that light sensitive paper surface with say, you know, the object on top. So let's say that this is my light sensitive paper. I put my object on top and, you know, I reveal that to the sunlight for a number of seconds and then I make it dark again, bring it into the dark room and expose it. That's basically the technique that he was using with rayographs. So we can take a look at this piece here. It's called, well, just rayograph from 1927. It's a done with gelatin silver, 11 and 7 16th by 9 and 1 8th. So we don't even really know what the original objects were that he put on the paper. And it actually has like a really kind of like abstracted effect to it. They, they might've been cubes of glass that he used. Who knows what all he put on this piece of light sensitive paper, but it did kind of create a cool effect, like almost like a painting, like an abstract painting. I might actually end up putting that video in the content area. We'll see. We might make an Ed puzzle or something with that. So watch out for that. So we're going to talk about photography and social change. So each generation produces its own memorable photographs. And these photographs can move us because of the way that subjects are presented, but also because we know the photographer was present at the scene. And we are actually feeling the same way. When we look at these photographs, we feel like we are actually joining them and witnessing this for ourselves in real time. So these images inform us, but they also stir our emotions at the same time. So a few decades after the invention of photography, photographers began to bring public attention to suffering caused by war, poverty, hunger, and um, neglect as well. So photography was really able to take social movements on, and it was able to make visual statements believable in ways that drawing or painting just couldn't do. It was just such a documentary type visual process that when somebody looks at a photograph it's just it's almost like looking into the window of of a real life honestly so of all the arts photography is uniquely suited to documenting events and social problems and it can also bring about public awareness that, that can lead to reform so we're going to talk about that social change aspect that photography has often been since the beginning almost involved in so Jacob Rees is kind of a leader of photography for social change. And he, his piece, Five Cents a Spot, it's actually a photograph, drew attention to squalid living conditions. And it actually ended up leading to improved housing and work safety. And the vividness of this photo made it possible by a recent invention um, at the time, which is flash photography, which is how they can illuminate this really dark area. Before the flash photography, before the flash was invented, the thing that, you know, creates the light basically for the photo to be taken, you know, they wouldn't have been able to take images like this before flash photography, because this is a very dark room. I doubt that they, these people had electricity. They're very poor. They're living in really unsafe conditions. So Jacob Rees was Danish born and he became an American in the late 19th century. And he photographed these squalid living conditions in the really poor areas of New York. And he published them for the world to see. And it really brought a lot of awareness of the public about what was going on in New York at the time. So it's called Five Cents a Spot. So I think, you know, for somebody to, to sleep here for the night, they would have to pay five cents and they'd either sleep on the floor in these really squalid, terrible conditions. And it really drew attention 
that led to stricter housing codes and also improved work, work safety laws. And the vividness of this photo, like I said earlier, was made possible through the use of flash photography, which allowed Reese to take his camera into previously unseen places because it would have just been too dark without that flash. And his most famous book, How the Other Half Lives, was a landmark in the social impact of photography. So he actually made a book of photography on how the other half lives, basically how poor people were living at this time. And it really was a huge problem at this time. You know, people just were not being, you know, they were starving, they were hungry, they didn't have safe working conditions. So his book, How the Other Half Lives, was really a great thing that happened that he did that helped bring a lot of change uh, and reform to some laws that helped out these factory workers. And I might actually do something with that video later. So for most of the 20th century, photography has had an unquestioned reputa reputation as the vehicle of truth, giving rise to the saying that the camera never lies. During the 1930s, Margaret Burke White introduced the concept of the photographic essay, which is an approach that other photo photographers soon adopted. And a, basically a photographic essay is basically a, a collection of photographs on a single subject, arranged in a way that tells a story or conveys a mood. That's really not possible with just one singular photograph. So Burke White actually documented the construction projects, some industrial plants, foreign customs, and also she is pretty famous for her depictions of Depression era poverty in many of her photographs. And I also do want to touch on the old saying, the camera never lies. That is something that is no longer applicable in our current times because of photo editing software such as Photoshop. Um, there's probably some more out there, but probably the most known at this stage is Photoshop. And so even the deep fake technology that's coming out with video uh, has really rendered that whole photography as a vehicle of truth idea as basically kind of an outdated idea. But there was a long time there that photography had its run where it was the vehicle of truth. And it was used for documenting um different things that were going on in the world. And it still is, but it's definitely with the use of digital photo editing softwares, it's possible to, you know, alter photos from the truth, basically. So here we're going to continue talking about Margaret Burke White, African-American flood victims lined up from 1937. Um, this is one of the most famous the images of the Depression in the United States. So in addition to focusing on social problems, photography has also aided the efforts of environmentalists. So as you can see, it's kind of ironic in this photo itself, world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. And there's like this really, you know, happy, smiley white family. Um, but yet there's all of these really impoverished um, African Americans lined up in this line. And it's kind of like this weird stark contrast between, you know, this idea of the American dream and they're all white, but yet the African Americans are, um, are basically in dire straits right now. So in this, in this photo, so it's kind of like this weird, weird juxtaposition of these two different, um, subjects basically. So it's been used for environmentalism, social, um, for social change, specifically environmentalism. Ansel Adams was an environmentalist in his own right. And he's a very famous photographer. If you know anything about photography, you probably have heard of Ansel Adams. So his photo photography really aided in the efforts of environmentalists. So Ansel Adams often used his photography to increase public awareness of the need for conservation of the natural environment. So his clearing winter storm um, taken in Yosemite National Park, California, really depicts the grandeur of nature. So we'll take a look at this. Ansel Adams, clearing winter storm, Yosemite National Park, 
from 1944. It's a photograph. So this photograph really renders the Yosemite val Valley in black and white. And there's really a lot of stark rock mingling with this really soft mist of the sky. And everything is in perfect fo focus, almost as if in an infinite depth of field, which Adams achieved by using a high f-stop or really bringing down the aperture or the hole on that camera to be really small, <clears throat> which made everything super in focus. He also carefully adjusted the lighting during the development process of the film by selectively exposing some parts of the picture frame to more light. Adams viewed aspects of nature as symbols of spiritual life, capable of trans transcending the conflicts of society. So, I mean, if you've ever gone for a walk outside after you've kind of had a bad day, it's just amazing how like going out in nature can really help your mental state. And I think, you know, Ansel Adams really understood, you know, nature is a part of us in a spiritual way. And so he really took the time with his photography to show his appreciation for nature. So in his photographs, nature really becomes a timeless metaphor for spiritual harmony. Let me take a look and just see what time it is. Okay, we still have a little bit of time. So today's environmental photographers oops, are more likely to focus on the serious human impact on our surroundings. For example, Chris Steele Perkins traveled to the Marshall Islands in 2004, and he found that rising sea levels because of you know climate change and all the ice caps melting are threatening the existence of the islands. And so he has a photo. Um, we're going to take a look at that from the series that he took in the Marshall Islands, and it shows a makeshift seawall created out of junk in a really desperate attempt to hold back rising tides. So not only are we dealing with climate change in this photo with the rising tides because the ice caps are melting because of global um, warming or global climate change, but also we're, they're using junk. They're using trash to hold back the water, which is really like those two things together. It's just so kind of ironic. Um, and it's such a testimony to what humans are doing to the earth and to ourselves. So it's just this makeshift wall created out of junk, and it's really this desperate attempt to hold back the rising tides. So he actually collaborated with some other photographers in an ex exhibition. It's called North, South, East, West, a 360 degree view of climate change, which was a worldwide um, compendium of views of the problem. So he was just one of um, several other photographers from around the world that were just taking pictures having to do with climate change. So I think we might just launch into the photography section, the color photography section in the next video.